So we began earlier talking about drawing near to God in the letter of the Hebrews, a uh, letter of uh, Hebrews, and that's coming out of Hebrews 11 and verse 6. where it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and must believe that he rewards those who seek him. And so we are talking about what it is to draw near. It turns out that drawing near appears multiple times in the letter to the Hebrews, and it's used in lots of different ways. We looked in an earlier lesson at the uses of this term leading up to the 11th chapter. And we're going to look at the last place in Hebrews 12 today. But this is a word that means something like approach, come near, come towards, you know. So there's a there's a boldness about it, you know, a direct approach, if you will, of getting close to God is should be a frightening thing in theory, since God dwells in unapproachable light. And, uh, you know, you have to have some things between you and God, you know. That's why we need a mediator in Christ Jesus. So we're looking then in Hebrews 12 at the last uses of drawing near, which, you know, again, what is it to approach God? Well, it's about our worship to him. It's our service to him. Becoming a Christian is part of that. I mean, that, that's the whole point. Christians, you know, in Acts chapter 2, are added to the number of the church. The, those who are being saved are added to the number. You, as a, an individual, are being saved. You, you are being delivered from the consequences of your sins in the past and being delivered uh, in the day of judgment as an individual. But you, as an individual, then, are added to the church that belongs to Christ, the church that he purchased with his blood. And so we are in this together. But it's good to understand that the spiritual realm excels the physical realm. We can overcome our circumstances here on earth if we have some bad ones, some bad things happening around us or to us. We can nonetheless escape in the spirit. We can be right with God. And then whatever happens here, which may be really awful, uh, is temporary. We know that we have a home in heaven with God who has promised these things to those who love him. So this is the meaning of drawing near to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the, you know, I guess, poetic name conferred on the city of Jerusalem, the, the place where God made his name to dwell. But it's called Mount Zion. Uh, it probably is literally Mount Zion. I mean, it is on a, a, you know, at elevation, and there is a mount up there. But this is meant to indicate the spiritual side of the thing. When you say Mount Zion versus Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a place on a map. Mount Zion is more useful for talking about the spiritual aspects of the place where God chose to have his name dwell. So we're focusing on the spiritual nature of our service to God, of our worship to God, of being a Christian, of being a part of the church, which is his body. Christ is its head. And the thing about that is when you draw near to Mount Zion, you're drawing you know, near to the, to the kingdom of the Lord, and the Lord bought it with his blood Citizenship in the kingdom of God has benefits, but it also has responsibilities. There's, there's both things that happen. When you become a citizen of God's kingdom, 
you are conferred the benefits, right? There is the forgiveness. There is the ability to approach God in prayer through Christ Jesus. God uh, works in your life when you don't know how to deal with something or you don't know how things can turn around. Well, God knows, and you lean on him in prayer, and things do work out. But it also has responsibilities. There's things we have to do to maintain that. There's responsibilities we have towards God and responsibilities we have towards one another that are part of it. And this is the meaning of drawing near in Hebrews 12. So at the beginning of this, which follows immediately on the 11th chapter, At the beginning of this, he says, we are looking back at those who walked by faith before us, those who were blessed by God, who embraced something that was future while their earthly circumstances were less than ideal. But because they believed God, they acted accordingly. They came to him, they cleansed their hearts and purified their lives They sought him and his purposes over themselves and their desires. And there's lots of these things recorded for us in Scripture. That's what Hebrews 11 is alluding to. So that the 12th chapter begins, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Drawing near to Mount Zion means running with endurance. There's a long term here. This is our life, not the sprint, but the marathon. This is the long run. So we're running with endurance A race is set before us. We have, you know, we have to get to the end of life. Nobody knows when that is, to be fair. (laughs) But you just set yourself that this is how it is from now on. I'm in this, you know, and I'm in it to win it. Run with endurance. Laying aside the weight, that is to say the training weights, and laying aside the sin which clings so closely, which clearly is, you know, a burden, not what you want when you're running, to be carrying the weight of sin. If you're working for God, if you're living for God, you need to get the sin out of your life, or you run the risk of not reaching that finish line. We look for strength to Jesus. He founded the faith. He completed the faith. He's the one who started it and the one who ended it, the first and the last. This Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. That's what they're saying when he looked forward to the kingdom, when he looked forward to our salvation, to sitting down with us in the kingdom and partaking of the supper. That joy set before him gave him the strength he needed to endure the cross, which was a really grueling endurance test. It's a horrible death. But we look to him for strength. We see that he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, so we know this has its outcome, it has its promise. There's a reason to do this. And when you get down into the 12th, Through the 15th verses, not only must we keep ourselves pure and continue, but also we look around to our left and to our right, to our brothers and sisters in this congregation. Lift your drooping hands, verse 12. Strengthen your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. So 
Sometimes we do have drooping hands and weak knees, you know. We get tired. We have things that uh, beset us in life that are exasperating, that are frustrating, that are hard. But we are to look about and help one another. Make a straight path for the feet, meaning clear the road. Help somebody. Get obstacles out of their way. Lift them up so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. You know, when something is is lame, that means there's an injury here. Does this injury lead to um, a break, you know, put out of joint? Or is this injury going to be healed? We're going to recover from this and go back. Now that's in some part up to us as we help those Christians who are with us on this road, you know, lifting them up, strengthening their knees, taking uh, burdens um, or, or hindrances out of their way. We owe it to one another to do this. What is lame should be healed. You know, the church should be a place where people get better, not worse. Uh, I chuckle a little because that seems maybe obvious, but um, it is obvious, I guess, in a proverbial way, if obvious exists. I'm not sure it does, but um, if obvious exists, that one is obvious, but only proverbially. When you actually take a look at what's happening in the churches, sometimes there are places for people to get worse, not better. Sometimes there are places where people learn to ignore what's happening around them, Ignore what's happening to their brothers or sisters, or worse yet, blame them for the bad things that are happening to them. Hold them responsible. Um, when the devil is the one, really, who is beset them and causing terrible things. Uh, it's true there is such a thing as consequences for sin, and we do have consequences. Sometimes we are the reason we've made bad choices and bad things happen. That's fair. But that's not what we're talking about here with drooping hands, weak knees, straight paths. The path is in front of you. Those are obstacles. These are things that are not about this person has sinned and that's why this bad stuff. Now, we're saying there's, there are things that are discouraging. There are things that are temptations. There are situations that are hard. We help each other get out of those things. But a lot of times what you see happening is people ignoring that or, like I say, worse yet, blaming you for it. It's like the Pharisees not willing, you know, tying up burdens, heavy burdens for others to carry. They themselves not willing to lift a finger. That's pharisaical in its way of thinking, and you do see that. But it's not scriptural. What we're called upon here is to help one another. The church should be a place where what is lame is healed. It should be a place where we improve, where we get better, where we help one another where it's, you know, in some sense, where it's safe. That if I have a problem, if I'm struggling with something, that I can tell you, I can talk to you about it, and you will help me, you will pray for me. Um, maybe give advice, maybe do other things, whatever the need might be. That's the way that it should be, because we're all, we all need the grace of God. We all need forgiveness. We all come to God. He's the one who is perfect, not me. The other thing you read about here in the 14th verse, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And the 15th verse, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble, and by it many be defiled. Well, that first thing is strive for peace. <laughs> strive is fighting, you know, wrestling. <laughs> what are you fighting for? We are fighting for peace. <laughs> we don't use weapons of carnal warfare. We don't leverage, um, you know, earthly tools 
relationships, you know, money, power, political influence. We don't use those things in the service of God. Our work is in the spirit. We ourselves are working for God. We are struggling. We are getting out of our comfort zone. We are being spent and spending for others so that there can be peace. We're looking for peace with everyone, which doesn't always doesn't always you know depend upon you, as Romans twelve says. It's not always up to you. Sometimes people just will not be at peace. I understand, but do strive for it. Make sure that if there isn't peace, it's because it's not possible, not because I gave up, <laughs> or or worse yet, didn't even try. And strive, too, for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We can't expect to live wrong and die right. If we want to see the Lord in that day, we're going to have to be holy. There's peace, which is loving your neighbor as yourself. And there's holiness, which is loving the Lord your God with all your strength, with all your soul. with all your mind. So both of those things fulfill all of the law. It is the call of the church to do this. And also, the the 15th, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. The root of bitterness here is from a passage in the Old Testament talking about let nobody stand here and agree with the words of the law in this assembly, but disagree secretly in their heart. Walk away and believe something else. Do something else. You know, let your confession be sincere. Let it be genuine. You know, shouldn't be a different person on the Lord's Day from what you are the night before that. And see to it is given to all of us and it is a sea there like the overseers. Like We are to be watchful for one another. We are to be on guard for one another. Make sure nobody else fails to obtain the grace of God. That if you see hypocrisy, if you see sin in their life, then you see to it that that doesn't go unchecked. That that doesn't get ignored. You know, have enough love in your heart for your fellow Christian, your fellow member in the local church. Go to them and say, what is this that I am seeing? It is not good. And I'll remind you of James 5, which, um, I'm sorry, 1 John 5. James 5 says, whoever turns a sinner from the from, uh, from the sin, the error of his way, saves a soul from death. But it's 1 John 5 that says, if you see someone sinning, not to death, pray for him, and God will forgive him. There's really good news in that. And you say, well, what, you know, and he says, there's sin that leads to death, there's sin that does not lead to death, you know, there's sin that leads to death, I don't say pray about that. And people say, well, what sin uh, is you know leads to death, and what sin doesn't lead to death? Is this the Catholic idea? No, the sin that leads to death is the sin that you die doing. <laughs> Somebody gets drunk and gets in a wreck and dies. You can't pray for them. There's nothing you can do about that. But while there's time, there's hope. So that if people are alive. You can pray about that, and that's a very good thing. But I don't mean that Hebrews 12, you know, 15, therefore it doesn't apply. That means I don't have to do anything. No, 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 no. I'm saying there's that supplement there in 1 John 5 that's very powerful, and I think it's good to keep that positive thing in mind that our prayers on behalf of our brethren, our watchfulness on behalf of our brethren is very effective in the eyes of God and can bring about a good result. Pray for one another. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Saying we 
We, come, we go to one another. We will say, what is this? If it's at all possible and you can talk to somebody, do it. It doesn't have to be left for the elders to do it. And certainly not here. If you do that here, there, then it will not be done because there are not any elders. <laughs> but even in places where there are elders, you know, this doesn't say, let the elders make sure that no one fails. No, it's, this is given to everybody. We're all to strive for peace, all to strive for holiness, and all of us must see to it that no one of us fails to obtain the grace of God. So having drawn near Mount Zion, you know, which comes up here later in the chapter, does involve these things, that if you come to the kingdom of God, yeah, there are, it can, you know, citizenship in that kingdom confers benefits, but it also assigns responsibilities. And these are among them. You know, lift drooping hands, strengthen weak knees, get obstacles out of the way for others. Strive for peace as well as holiness. That's the kind of striving that Christians do. And make sure that nobody, no individual, fails. And we help each other on. Now, you see, in the 18th verses, we move on here. He says, You have not come to what may be touched, and he's talking here about the fire and the smoke, the mountain when the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, and the Lord spoke to Moses and delivered the Ten Commandments. At that time, it was terrifying. And, you know, they had just come out of Egypt and they had crossed the Red Sea as on dry land and then they come. To this place in the wilderness where they wait and Moses goes up and talks to God. Remember, they hear the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the trumpet that is the really loud otherworldly blast that is God's voice coming from the sky above them where there is the thick darkness the cloud the smoke the the uh, tempest the thunder the lightning it's a terrifying thing and yet it's a physical manifestation you know in our you know, earthly place to go out into a wilderness where there's nothing else around and you have this mount where God makes this appearance and that's what it's like to deal with him. But now, you know, we are not that Israelite generation that came out of Egypt. That's not what we have come to. Not something that may be touched with your hands. Instead, at verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion, a spiritual kingdom. All right, so this is the major structure here at the end of the chapter. Is first of all, there is that old, the first law the symbols and types, the patterns of what was going to come and be realized in a spiritual way. <clears throat> and then there is the spiritual thing, which is the real thing. What have we not drawn near? It's that which is recorded in 18 and 19. You not come near and this is drawn near, by the way. When he says you have not come to what may be touched, he's saying you're not drawn near. It's the same drawn near as all the other ones we've read in Hebrews 11. I meant to point that out. Sorry. 
<laughs> That's how we got here. <laughs> like I said, obvious doesn't exist, right? So, all right. Um, you have not drawn near that which may be touched, a blazing fire, darkness and gloom and a tempest, which is a thunderstorm, and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. Now, that's kind of incredible when you think about it, because we always think about the loudness of it, <laughs> the trumpet, the lightning, the thunder, that this is terrifying, and it is. And some things are very loud and make you cover your ears. And, you know, loud sounds are a universal frightening thing to animals and babies and all of us, really. Sudden loud noises are always frightening. It's natural. And we would think this is the thing, but that's not the thing. What terrified them, it says, is the words that he spoke. <laughs> The words that he spoke. For they couldn't endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight, Moses said, I tremble with fear. It was so holy. It was so unapproachable. If even an animal oversteps the boundary, they put it to death by stoning. That's the content of the message that terrified them more than you know the, the things that were appearing before their eyes. And Moses saw that thing that was terrifying, the sight of it, and trembled. As terrifying as that is, as awesome as that is, that is awe-inspiring, that's not what we have come to. That's not what we have drawn near. We have drawn near something greater, which is Mount Zion. That's the point. Something higher, something greater. We have drawn near Mount Zion. At verse 22 of Hebrews 12. To the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, There we are. Two, we've, we've drawn near innumerable angels in festal gathering to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous who have been perfected, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And I do want to look at these again. Notice with me in that 22nd verse, Mount Zion is the spiritual name of Jerusalem. We've come to something much higher. They were in the wilderness when they received these words, and it was the tent. Much later, after they are in the promised land, the, the, the uh, land is delivered to them, they have been built up, there is peace under David and under Solomon such that they build a temple in Jerusalem, the place that God has chosen to make his name dwell. And that's when we begin to refer to Mount Zion, the spiritual capital of the spiritual kingdom of God. So this is the maturity of what began with the Exodus. And that thing that came before was just a shadow, Hebrews 8 tells you. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Jesus has entered a tabernacle not made with hands. The real thing is the church that belongs to Christ. This is Mount Zion. This is the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
And there's reference to this in, in uh, the Revelation. We talk about the vision of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband, which, of course, is a reference to Hebrews 5, where the church is the bride of Christ, and actually is a reference to many, many different illustrations of the prophets in the Old Testament, where the people of God are his wife, his bride. But it is the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, it's not the earthly Jerusalem, you see. It's not a, a city made by men. It's a city whose builder and founder is God. A city that is not here. And if our earthly tent is destroyed, we know that we have a heavenly dwelling, a dwelling in the heavens from God that is eternal. It's a better capital city, the Church of Christ. Innumerable angels in festal gathering is an interesting thing, but it's to say those who serve God, those who are his messengers, perhaps you would say this refers to those who wrote the scriptures down or those who uh, you know, were their judges. But we're talking today about well, everyone who's serving God now and those who served him in the past, who today rejoice in paradise. We're talking about those, perhaps, who are still actually angels today, but there is a fest. That is to say, they've come together and it's to rejoice because the kingdom of God is here. It's real and it's a cause for rejoicing. Uh, as J Jesus said in John chapter 8, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. It is also, he says, the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, which is what we re referred to earlier in Acts 2, where they, those who are being saved are added to the number when your name is written in heaven, you're enrolled in heaven. And when that happens, you are added to the church, which is the assembly. Church is just, um, it's just the English word that we use to translate what, what in the original is assembly. It's the assembly, which is the congregation. When you're, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it's very Jewish. You read about the congregation in the wilderness with the congregation of the people of Israel. That's the assembly, the church. Um, synagogue is another Greek word that means assembly or congregation. So wherever they came together, they called that synagogue. That's a local church, okay? Those are the exactly the same thing. That's the same terms. This is the church of the firstborn from the dead, Jesus Christ. It's not the earthly assembly, the congregation that left Israel or that left uh, Egypt and grumbled against God, many of whom died in that wilderness. We're not here to die in this wilderness. We are supposed to run this race with endurance. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, as we read earlier. And we've drawn near to God, judge of all. Through Jesus, we have access to God. He judges everybody, but we overcome in judgment through Christ Jesus. We have drawn near the spirits of the righteous made perfect, as we talked about earlier. That is, there are people who do right and who are made perfect or completed, who have reached maturity in Christ Jesus. It's good to be among the saints, the people of God. And we've drawn near Jesus, mediator of a new agreement, a new covenant. He is the mediator, the one who is between us. It is 1 Timothy 2, that, um, verses 1 through 4, that talk about Jesus being the mediator between, the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who has flesh as you and I have flesh, who is tempted in all points, like as we, yet without sin, as Hebrews said earlier. 
and we have drawn near his sprinkled blood, the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel was righteous, and he was sacrificed by his brother. And his blood cried out to God for justice. Jesus' blood is also shed when he is sacrificed by his brothers, by us. But his blood speaks better things than Abel's. His blood saves. His blood washes away sins and ratifies the covenant between us and God. This is what we have drawn near. It's far greater than what came before is the point. And so he says at verse 25, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they didn't, refu- uh, they didn't escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, that is ancient Israel, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. The stakes are higher. We must make no excuses to God. This is the conclusion, by the way. We must make no excuses to God. We have to offer to him acceptable worship. He is speaking from heaven. You think, I'm speaking. No, I'm just reading. (laughs) I'm doing the best I can to get out of the way and let the word come forth and be presented in its purity, in its simplicity. God is the one who is speaking, and he speaks from heaven. So we make no excuses to him. What keeps you from worshiping God? What keeps you from coming to services? What keeps you from reaching out to your brothers and sisters whom you see and you know are in need, spiritual or otherwise? What excuse will you give to the one who speaks from heaven? Let's not do that. Rather, in verse 28, let us therefore be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and with awe. For our God is a consuming fire. We have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is the eternal kingdom. This is what everything was written about. The prophets longed to see the things that we see and did not. This is everything. The church is everything to him. He gave his life. He shed his blood for it. What is it to me? Let us offer acceptable worship. Let us have reverence and awe. And I'll close this with the idea again. God's character is unchanged from the Old Testament to the New. Sometimes people say that, oh, he was different then. He used to be a God of anger and retribution. And now he's a God of love and overlooking sin. Like, mm, no, that's not true. You didn't get that from reading the Bible. He remains in the new covenant as he had been in the old covenant, a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. We need to approach him with reverence and with awe. If we're going to draw near, that's how we draw near, with reverence and awe. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus? Why not? Do you think perhaps that you are beyond reach? Not so. God has the power to save. God has the power to resurrect from the dead. You're not dead yet. It's not that bad. God can beat whatever it is that is a problem for you. The thing to do is to come to God in simple trusting faith, to become a Christian, so that you have access to him through the blood of Christ so that the grace and the mercy of God can be conferred to you through Christ. Let us draw near, Hebrews 10 to 22 says, with a true heart, in full assurance of faith. The faith is not in ourselves, it's in God who saves. I'm confident not 
that I am great or that I am perfect, but that God is great and God is perfect and that God can save me, even me. My faith is in Him. Draw near like this with a heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and a body washed with pure water. The blood of Christ sprinkles clean the pure conscience. The water of baptism is the pure water that he's talking about. Not that there's power in the water in and of itself. It's just because God said to do it this way, that's all. And so we do it this way. If you haven't done these things, you're not a Christian. You don't have forgiveness of sins. You don't have hope. You don't have access to the throne of grace. But God is the same God, and the judgment is the same judgment. You're just not ready for it. That's all. There's no reason to stay in that state. Become a Christian. Get for yourself forgiveness of sins. Are you perhaps a Christian today but have not lived right? Repent. Let us pray for one another. Remember what Hebrews said, that we are concerned. We lift drooping hands. We strengthen weak weak knees. We make straight paths. We take obstacles out of one another's way. Let us pray for you and for one another, for ourselves. For none of us is above temptation. If you need to obey the gospel, if you need the prayers of the saints, please let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected.